Hey, what's up, uh, Real Life Online? Uh, my name is Mike Bro, and I have the privilege of being on the teaching team at Real Life. And uh, I want to welcome you to Ventura, California. Uh, this is our 1965 Fixer Upper. It was a wreck of a place when we bought it. I love doing that kind of stuff and working on it for about six years now, uh, whenever I can. And we've been wanting to have you all over for a long time, so we thought, what better time than the series we're currently in to invite everybody over our house. So invite you to come on in. Uh, as you can see, the, this uh, is our happy place. Lots of fun goes on in this house, and hope it's fun for you today. Come on in. Uh, let, me, let me give you a, a quick tour. And uh, I'll tell you, this tour, it won't take too long because this, it's a pretty small house, but we, we, we love it. As, uh, as you can see, this is kind of the hangout room right here. This is where uh, uh, you know, we watch movies and build puzzles on the table and you can kind of tell we got that coastal farmhouse thing going on. It's like we're from Kentucky, so it's like Kentucky meets Ventura, which is like Ventucky, and that's who we are, and this is what this house kind of represents. But we have a lot of fun in here, and everything in here is like repurposed. Love doing that stuff, finding stuff on the side of the road or, or, or at the Habitat Restore or a garage sale and just kind of refurbishing, like those candlesticks over there by the fireplace. They're at buck ninety nine at Goodwill. And Debbie just threw some chalk paint on it and scuffed them up. Now they look kind of cool. But that's, that's our house, and that's, that's the main room. Come on in. We'll take you in here. Uh, we, uh, we, we have a little, uh, we have a table here. A lot of, uh, uh, we, ha we have nine grandkids. So uh, uh, at this table, there's a lot of coloring that goes on. There's a lot of, like, construction paper and cutting stuff out and pasting and gluing and stuff happens. At this table, we got the... Uh, the back patio, we use the back patio all the time. In fact, I just had 12 guys on it this morning for a little Bible study, which was awesome. We used it all during the pandemic to meet outside, and it was a cool spot for us to land and, and still kind of stay together after we Zoomed for a long time. Then we got a little nook over here where the kids just kind of watch movies and play video games and stuff. They just, you can see our family picture. That's our family at the pier in Ventura. And uh, yeah, this is, this, is the, this is the hub, really, the kitchen. This is about all there is to our house. Uh, we, we tore out a bunch of walls in here. I can remember when my son and I were tearing out the soffit here in the kitchen, a dead rat falls out. And I told him, I said, dude, don't tell your mom. And she didn't know until about two years ago there was a dead rat in the ceiling. But it was, the place was a wreck, so we gutted it and started over and took some walls out so we could just open it up and have people just hang out with us. This, uh, we found this old island, uh, really not an island, it came out of a fish camp. But we thought that, that'd be a cool island. So we, just, we, we bought this old rundown thing and it serves as our island. Uh, and we took a wall out here so we could open this all up. And uh, we, we didn't have enough room because the house is pretty small, but this is, uh, uh, I was gonna put base cabinets here, but they were too wide, too deep. So we just used wall cabinets for a base, built a little platform and made a, made a coffee bar. So this coffee bar gets used all the time. In fact, it's gonna get used right now. I'm gonna grab a cup of coffee here that I made a little bit earlier. And I made it in my real life mug. That is product placement right there. So I just wanna invite you, man, to grab a cup of coffee and just welcome to our home. Uh, grab a seat around the table and we're gonna dive into the series that we've been in. This is week three of Bless. And uh, I gotta tell you, we really are excited to have you in our home today. Uh, I know it's virtual, but hey, we love having people over. And like I said, we are in the middle of a series where we're encouraging each other uh, to identify the people and places that God might be calling us to bless. And we're using the acrostic uh, bless that our friends Dave and John Ferguson came up with in their book by the same name, Bless. And if you've been tracking with us, week one was the letter B, which stands for begin with prayer. Where we talked about just talking to God about the opportunities and the timing, the creative ways to bless people in your world. Last week, if you're with us, you know the L stood for listen. We just said, we don't have to know all the answers. It's just much better just to kind of shut up and listen sometime and get to know somebody's story and hear about their struggles and their joys and hear about all their family stuff and their dreams. So just, just listen. And today I'm super excited. And the reason we're around this kitchen table is because the E in BLESS stands for eat. I, mean, I love to eat, don't you? I mean, I think Americans really love to eat. As a culture, we are super serious about our food, aren't we? All kinds of television shows. We even have the Food Network, countless cookbooks, diet plans, podcasts. We even have eating competitions. Did you know there are actual professional leagues for competitive eating? 
Then I'm sure you have seen like those uh, competitive hot dog eater guys. You know, it's an annual ESPN event where they're downing hot dogs at an alarming rate. But did you know there's actually lots of different food competitions, such as the crawfish eating competition? Now, my name is Bro, B-R-E-A-U-X, and it's a Cajun name, so I might be good at that. But I'm telling you, we'll never know. <laughs> what about this one? The onion eating competition. I, I'm, I'm tearing up just thinking about it. Or maybe you'd be up for the fruitcake eating competition. Not in a million years for me. Fruitcakes are gross. And speaking of gross, you're not going to believe this one. There is a mayo eating contest. Uh, the world record for the most mayonnaise consumed in a single s- setting is four 32-ounce bowls eaten in eight minutes. I just want to throw up thinking about it. Now, I wouldn't mind entering like a street taco eating competition because that they're the best. But the deal is we love to eat. And we eat like 21 times a week, not including snacks. So many of us are eating on the go in our cars. We're ordering Grubhub so we can sit in front of a television or play video games while we eat. I mean, we're doing a lot of eating. And we're doing a lot of eating alone. You know, one of the values uh, in my home growing up was being around the table. And it wasn't so much about food as it was the people around the table. And Debbie and I raising our kids, we just made sure we had dinner together. Now, it wasn't always possible. But most nights, we'd like throw something on the grill or whip up some stir fry or something in the crock pot or we'd order pizza and we'd sit down together. And I'm just telling you, we have a lot of memories around the table. I mean, so many friends and neighbors and small groups and basketball teams we had over and extended family have spent time around this table. Again, I don't remember many of the actual meals that we consumed, but the laughter and the friendship and the sharing and the significant announcements that happened and the important conversations that happened around the table... They're pretty unforgettable. In fact, did you know the studies show that eating with people has enormous benefits? For instance, research shows that when children and teenagers eat regularly with their families, they experience, first of all, healthier eating on into adulthood. They, they, they have a less a danger of developing eating disorders. They have less al- drug and alcohol abuse. They have higher self-esteem and less depression. They do better with school. They post higher scores on achievement tests, and on and on the research goes. And again, it's not the food. It's the table. It's the community, the security, the sense of belonging that is fostered here. There's just something about eating together. You know, I was thinking how Jesus, uh, being a carpenter, probably made like all kinds of stuff. You know, houses, uh, ladders, bookcases, chairs, tables. And even though he never really owned one, he made sure he was around someone's table a lot. I mean, Jesus recognized the importance of just eating together. In fact, he was very intentional about it. You know, a lot of Jesus' ministry was centered around meals. He spent time around the table with friends like Lazarus and uh, Mary and Martha, uh, Simon the leper, uh, Simon the Pharisee, a little guy named Zacchaeus. He performed his first miracle at a big wedding feast. He fed 5,000 people on a hillside one day. Uh, In fact, the night before his crucifixion, he sat around a table with his closest friends. And then after his resurrection, he shared breakfast on the beach with those same close friends around a campfire. Uh, Eating was a big deal to Jesus. It was a big deal in Jesus' culture. As people who like, you know, scarf down fast food while we're driving our cars with our knees, I'm not sure we're really capable of grasping how central eating was to life back then. You see, eating with somebody in those days was a statement that you wanted to be with them. Eating with somebody was an affirmation of that person's value, their dignity, their worth. In fact, who you ate with indicated who you liked, who you loved, who you cared about, who you considered to be part of your social class. That's why it was so outrageous to the religious leaders that Jesus frequently ate with the lowest and most despised people of his day. I mean, they would say, come on. If, if, if you are like really from God, there's no way you would eat with those kind of people. Matthew was one of those kind of people. He was a tax collector, worked for the Roman government, which was the enemy to the Jews, the oppressor of the Jews. He wasn't accepted by anybody outside of his despised group. The Romans looked down on him. They used him. His own people, the Jews, disdained him as a non-patriotic sellout. I mean, guys like him were looked at as the scum of the earth. But one day Jesus says two life-changing words to Matthew. He looks him in the eye and says, follow me. 
Well, Matthew accepts the invitation to follow Jesus, and the first thing he does is throw a party. He opens his home, he opens his table, he opens up his fridge, he invites Jesus and the guys over to eat. And I just think it's kind of cool that it's Matthew himself who actually writes about this in the account of the life of Jesus. And I bet as he was like writing this down, he even got a little choked up. Look what it says. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me. Be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Then it says this, but when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, hey, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, uh, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And then he added this. Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And this is so cool to me because the first thing Jesus does after Matthew says yes to his invitation he, he doesn't like enroll Matthew in a class on how to be a good disciple. He doesn't challenge Matthew to start studying the Bible and memorizing a bunch of scripture. Now, don't get me wrong. Those things are good things. Those are important things. But the first thing Jesus does, he goes to Matthew's house to eat. By eating with him, Jesus was saying, Matthew, you're accepted. You matter. You have value. You belong. I choose to hang with you. Now, did you catch that term that was used there in the scripture, the, the term, quote unquote, sinner? In, in those days, uh, sinner was a derogatory catch-all label for anybody who wasn't religious or somebody who was involved in something like prostitution. So here is Jesus, this esteemed rabbi, actually God in the flesh, eating with the most despised and looked down people of his day. And I hope that perhaps you're getting a more accurate picture of what God is really like. Well, the Pharisees, the leaders of the religious establishment, they're not having it. I mean, they are offended by the scandalous dinner party. So they, they don't ask Jesus to his face. You notice that? They pull aside a disciple or two and they ask him, hey, so, so why does your teacher eat with such scum? These, these tax collectors and these, these disreputable sinners. Well, Jesus overhears them, or he already knows what they're going to say before they say it, which I think is probably the case. And I don't know whether this is the case or not, but I kind of picture Jesus with a mouthful of food responding with, hey, oh, Excuse me, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. Now, Jesus here is not saying the Pharisees were healthy, good people who didn't need a doctor. In fact, he alludes to them being lost in their sense of self-righteousness. When he says, go and really learn what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament here, which the Pharisees were famous for like, knowing forwards and backwards. The Pharisees were like all-stars at performing religious ritual. They were busy keeping all the rules, but they were putting labels on people and ignoring the poor and the vulnerable and the marginalized. So Jesus is saying here, you know what God says? You know what he says? He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. But you don't really know what this means. And if you do, you aren't living it out. You see, Jesus was on mission with his life. And the Pharisees just didn't get it. And this tension between Jesus and the Pharisees over who Jesus ate with is not like an isolated incident. They were on him all the time about this. In fact, one time over in Luke, uh, Jesus calls out their criticism when he says, the son of man, which was one of Jesus' favorite terms about himself, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton, he's a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. Now, Jesus wasn't a drunk. Truth is, he wasn't a glutton. But he ate so frequently with people that were that he got accused of it a lot. What we see in Jesus' life is that eating, being around a table with other people, was integral to his mission. You might call Jesus a missional eater. He just blessed people by sharing meals with them. I like what Henry Nouwen writes. He says, when we invite friends for a meal, we do much more than offer them food for their bodies. We offer friendship. Fellowship, good conversation, intimacy, and closeness. When we say, help yourself, take some more, don't be shy, have another glass. We offer our guests not only our food and drink, but also ourselves. A spiritual bond grows, and we become food and drink for each other. Isn't that good?
Uh, when we eat together, we're doing way more than simply sharing a meal. You and I are living on mission. You know, real estate experts will tell you, man, the kitchen, man, that's what sells a house. Hey, you you might, might watch some of those, you know, HGTV, like house hunter shows and people walk in a house and they walk in the kitchen and they'll go, oh, this is my dream kitchen. I can prepare over here and, and I can cut up stuff over here. And I can just picture everybody sitting here and there. I mean, the kitchen's a significant room. People love to hang in the kitchen. I was talking with a single girl on staff and she invited a bunch of friends and neighbors over. Kind of was throwing like a Matthew party. And she has this kind of cool loft attic vibe in her little house. And, and she said, you know, man, I cleaned my entire place. I had candles going. I fluffed the pillows on my comfy couches. I could not get people out of the kitchen. They spent the entire night sitting on the countertops. And I just think that says something about her. She has the ability to make people feel at home. People sense that she just likes them, that she values real community. They feel like they can just be themselves around her. Her kitchen feels like a place they belong. They know that like her fridge is their fridge. You know, a huge part of the explosive growth in the early church was the amazing community that went on. In fact, they called it the koinonia. It's a Greek word. This literally meant the shared life. Now, it was not some weird, oppressive, cultish commune kind of thing, but a joy-filled, together kind of place where people began to experience belonging and meaningful connection and deep, deep friendship with God and each other. The society of that day was one not unlike ours. It was full of hate and elitism and segregation and religious and political oppression. But these followers of Jesus had seen him around tables, and they just decided to do the same, to take his lead. Look what is written about this brand new community in Acts chapter 2. And all the believers met together constantly and shared everything they had. They sold their possessions and shared the proceeds with those in need. And like they're saying, my fridge is your fridge. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They had times of corporate worship. They met in their homes for the Lord's Supper. In other words, they remembered Jesus when they got together. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. They opened their tables. They got intentional about eating with other people. And then it says, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. It began to explode around tables. The authentic community was like this breath of fresh air. It was real. It was raw. It was relational. And you know what? It wasn't even well organized. It was just really organic. It wasn't like their marketing scheme or their intricate discipleship program. It was simply a place of joy and food and generosity. It was a place where you could be yourself and just belong. It was permeated with grace and truth and a sense of purpose and goodwill and acceptance and oneness and love. At one of the churches I used to serve, uh, we had a small group who all lived in the same neighborhood, and uh, they really wanted to bless their neighbors. They wanted to get to know their neighbors. So they made these flyers, and they put them in everybody's mailbox, and the flyer said, first annual such and such neighborhood barbecue, and it had the date and where it was going to be at this neighborhood park, and it said, hamburgers and hot dogs and drinks will be provided. If your last name is like A through L, bring this. If it's M through Z, bring this. We'll have games for kids and adults. Let's get to know each other. And they put the flyers in everybody's mailbox, and they wondered if anybody was going to show. I mean, they, they started worrying that like the six of them might be eating like 200 hamburgers, but 176 people showed up. Most of them had never met each other. And they had so much fun and so much laughter, so many stories. And one of the stories that came out of this barbecue, you know the house in the neighborhood that like everybody talks about? You know that house kind of needs repair? Well, they met the person who lived there. It was a single mom of three kids whose husband had been killed in Afghanistan. And the neighbors decided to pull together and just fix the gutters and fix the shutters and mow the lawn and re-landscape re everything. They just poured love all over this woman and her kids. I'm just saying, take a risk. Do stuff like that. Open your home, open your table, your kitchen. Go over, eat a meal, have some fun. Get to know your neighbors and just see what God might do. You know, God might lead you to a new friend that you've really needed. Or He might lead you to be the friend that somebody else has needed. You may discover a, a group of new friends with whom you do the, the share life. I mean, who knows? It could turn into something where together, like as a whole neighborhood, you really start caring for each other. I mean, just, just picture a world 
where people are eating with each other and talking to each other and learning from each other. I mean, I'm just listening, laughing, crying, connecting to one another. That's the picture that Jesus painted with his life around tables. In their book called Right Here, Right Now, Alan Hirsch and Lance Ford write this, sharing meals together on a regular basis is one of the most sacred practices we can engage in as believers. Missional hospitality is a tremendous opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. If every Christian household regularly invited a stranger or a poor person into their home for a meal once a week, we would literally change the world by eating. They're just saying there's power around a table where love and belonging is served up as the main course. My wife, Debbie, has the gift of hospitality. Plus, she's an extrovert that is fueled by being around people. She loves tables full of food and people. We had 15 people in our house yesterday. It was, it was full. Her, her favorite scripture is, God sets the lonely in family. Her favorite quote is from Mother Teresa. It says, the problem with our world is we draw our family circles way too small. So Debbie likes drawing big circles the way Jesus did. You know, for years now, we've had a Sunday lunch and... Uh, it's just a thing we do. Sometimes there's 10 of us. Sometimes there's 40 of us. We never really know who might show up. We had a bunch of people here yesterday. It might be a random person we met at church or at the ball field or a waitress at a restaurant. And one time she brought her boyfriend, friends of friends. One time we invited a single guy to come along. He said, can I bring something? We said, no. So he brings a bottle, box of Captain Crunch. It was just, you know, we just have fun together. We eat, hang out. There's people always taking naps in there. Or they're watching ball games on television. The kids are swimming. We got a small spot out back to play a little pickleball. And they're watching movies, playing cards. It's just what we do. It's a generational thing. Debbie's mom did it. Her mom's mom did it. And I got invited in that family when I was 16, and we've been doing it ever since. Uh, every Sunday we're in town anyway. I first remember when Deanna moved in with us. She was a girl we'd met at Real Life who just needed a change of scenery and a, and a recovery program that would be transformational in her life. So she came to Kentucky to a place called The Refuge, and she would graduate from that program and put in the work, and then she moved in with us for a few years in Kentucky. Uh, she's now married with twin girls. She just released her second book. I mean, what God has done in her life is simply miraculous. And I can remember how she would kind of sit and observe those Sunday lunches. I mean, it was so foreign to her. She didn't quite know what to think because she had watched her mom slit her own wrist. Her dad had bailed out on them when she was a little kid. He, she hit the streets at a young age looking for love in all the wrong places, as they say. She got deeply involved in the sex industry. I mean, addictions, rough life, no real family to call her own. Her favorite verse became this one over a little obscure Old Testament book called Joel, where God says, you know what? I'm going to give you back all the years the locusts have eaten. And it's been so cool to watch him doing that for her. Well, she wrote this little spoken word piece and told me I could share it with you guys. I'll do my best. I shared it recently at our Simi Valley campus, but she just calls it, God restores my idea of family. And she writes, screaming, hitting leaving me behind, or bloody towels and razors I would find. A mom so sick just wanted to give up while endless wine filled up her cup. A dad who tried to keep it all together, who promised through adoption to stay with us forever, only to find he would lose his wife, and late at night try to make sense of his life. So searching for a family to let me in, I would run away and try to begin the process of blending in, only to be thrown away again. Bouncing in and out of people's lives, dodging abuse, and the great pain that thrives. The church decides to take an interest in me, saying, God wants you home. Come and see what it's like to be loved while you rest and be. Come and heal your heart. This year is free. After years of families here in each other's face, I sit back and think, what is this place? I dine with this family of 20 or more. Filled with joy each week, no one looks for the door. I know it will take time for this all to make sense. For now, I'll let down the walls so I can see over the fence. So this is what happens when generations are set free by the love of Jesus, the one and only key. The time has come, and here is that hour that God restores what the locusts devoured. Again, God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free, and he gives them joy. What do you think it would look like? You know, if, if places like In-N-Out Burger or Chipotle or 
Starbucks or our apartment complexes, the lobby of our dorm, uh, the park, our homes, our kitchen tables just became hubs for missional eating. I believe we'd end up blessing the world. Yeah, even though he never really owned one, Jesus made sure he was around somebody's table a lot. And you know what? He wants to be around your table too. He wants to connect with you, give you that sense of belonging, and bless you with love. You know, every, every week uh, at Real Life, we uh, get around a table and we remember Jesus. You know, when Jesus was telling his followers about his death, he, he didn't like give them a theory. He just gave them a meal. And he, and he said, this bread right here represents my body that's going to be broken. And this cup is going to represent my blood that will be spilled to wash away sin for all time. So today, I want to invite you to sit around the table of Jesus. Just grab whatever you got. And let's just eat and drink today. In honor of him, I'll pray, and then we'll give you some time to do that. Father, thank you so much for the beauty of community. Thank you for making us in such a way that we need each other. And when we open our homes and open our lives and open our doors and open our fridge and open our tables and we just do community together, there's something rich happens. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Thanks for modeling that. Thank you for sitting down at a table table in an upper room and giving us a reminder of the greatest gift that's ever been given us. So we eat and we drink today in honor and memory of you. We do it with deep, deep gratitude. Amen.